Speech trembling, rage rising, heart breaking, Steve Kerr tried to give voice to America's unique pain. When are we going to do something, he yelled helplessly Tuesday, pounding the table before the alleged big game. When? 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 Something. 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 Nobody slaughters kids at schools the way our country does. Nobody slaughters kids at school the way our country does. Nobody slaughters kids at school the way our country does. The world is deeply divided, violent and hostile and dangerous, unfathomably barbaric in many places. Nobody slaughters kids at school the way our country does. This time it was the name Uvalde, Texas we all learned at once because it carries the forever stain of introducing us again to the worst kind of pain, innocence extinguished. Robb Elementary School this time, 19 children and two adults dead. The numbers climbed overnight. The kids were hard to identify, the horror done to their faces. More numbers, so many numbers, numb, numb, numbing numbers. It took CNN more than three minutes Tuesday to list all of the United States cities that have had mass shootings this year, more than 200 so far. It's only May. A kid bought two assault rifles for his 18th birthday, and the gift to himself as he walked into adulthood and into that school was picking off scared innocents one by one. This will lead to the immediate and inevitable arguments about politics and video games and gun safety you can find in any crevice of the divided states of America today, as it always does, but that is merely displacement for all of our drowning. It's what you do when you know you can't do anything, but must do something. This anguish is helpless and hopeless. We must scream something because stewing in the heavy and empty weight of the silence and the sobbing feels like accepting something that can't ever be accepted, even as we're forced to accept it again and again. It's the worst pain a human can know burying your child. We argue about the most basic facts these days, but we don't argue about that. When Kerr screams enough and says he's tired of condolences and moments of silence, there's no rebuttal. It feels better to scream. Not good, mind you, not good, just better. It's better than doing nothing, but not by much, because it won't be long before we're screaming and grieving again. We scream at lawmakers, at each other, at God, at coffins, at life's cruelty and deaths. A wailed, when are we going to do something, never comes with an actual answer, takes away any of that pain. Both sides in politics get accused of living in an echo chamber these days, but we all live together in the one where, when are we going to do something, is screamed again and again in some form, different month, different school, different city, and it bounces off the haunting echo chamber walls forever without an answer. A little quieter with each repetition, until it returns with righteous rage and grief, the next inevitable time children are slaughtered yet again, the sound fading less quickly than those lives did. No matter what you think America is or should be, no matter how much stupidity we file under politics these days, we live in a country where there are no safe spaces left to hide from this uniquely American sickness. Our guns aren't safe. Our background checks aren't safe. Our schools aren't safe, our children aren't safe, our country isn't safe, our love isn't safe. The hate sure as hell seems to be, though. Outrageous. That's what this is. I felt it almost everywhere I went yesterday. People literally trembling mad. Angrier than they were before this, and we were plenty angry as a place before this. The word has lost some of its meaning. Outrage is so in vogue. But yesterday, it went from inside to outside. Out, rage, get out. Get out, rage, get out of us. Out, rage, us. You drop your kids off and you trust their life with others. You expect to always get them back. It's an understanding we have of school, of life. Such a precious trust. 
parents often cry on the first day, letting go. Life is up ahead in the discovery of those books and those classrooms and those relationships. Not death, life. Schools are where life is. That's where we send our innocence to learn, to grow, to be developed, not extinguished. Laughter fills a playground, not blood. The ground is for play there, not burial. Schools are supposed to be sturdy and secure places that protect the most valuable and precious things, like treasure chests or bank vaults or wombs. Walking a child to school or to the bus toward adulthood is a postcard snapshot of what love could look like if it had a shape. There is little worse than you can say about a place than that it can't protect its most vulnerable. But it's something we can say about America now without dispute. Such a uniquely American sickness. Unlike anywhere else in the world, we're the headquarters for this. The world's biggest supplier. This was the deadliest shooting at a U.S. elementary school since Sandy Hook a decade ago. The deadliest shooting in the modern history of gun-toting Texas. That's 26 school shootings resulting in injury or death in the U.S. in 2022. I will not offer you solutions. I will not argue about politics or guns. I don't go to pay respects at a funeral to get into an argument with the grieving pallbearers about the Second Amendment. Somewhere between the moments of silence and the moments of screaming, we bow our heads with condolences that don't console and pray to God or scream at God through helpless and terrified pleas that a school even closer to home than this isn't next. It is so hard to come by empathy these days, but this one hits everyone in the heart because we all imagine in the randomness of it, in the cruelty, in the unimaginable horror of dropping kids off at school with so much life and then never getting to touch that life again, that it could be us next because it could be. When are we going to do something? It haunts the sound of it, the grief in it, the cry, the despair it's soaked in. When are we going to do something? When are we going to do something? When are we going to do something? We will get to, at some point this hour, we will get to with Amino Hass and Tom Haberstrow a pretty important game in the Heat season. They kind of need to win this one. I will not do must game, Stugatz. Must win, that's a fine. I, I mean, will not do must, a must game and a must win are the same thing. A must game? It's a must have game, a must win. There's no such thing as a must game. They have to play the game whether they want to or not. I mean, if that's what you're trying to say. Okay, so it's not just. They must play. Okay, yes. I was going to say that we. Uh, it's a little awkward to segue lightheartedly from what it is that we just did into the must-win game of tonight that isn't a must-win. I'm an is, asshole. That really all that's in play is the must of everyone needs to show up, and it wouldn't surprise too many people, I don't suppose, if uh, the next two, two games were as confusing as the first four. <laughs> but before we get to that, I can feel in the room, and uh, many of you are new fathers here. You are young fathers. And I imagine that uh, yesterday lands on everyone similarly. I mean, no, like legitimately, we have very little in this country that lands the same on, on everybody, but no matter where you are, like the idea of kids being slaughtered in a school randomly when you've seen school buses pull up to schools, you don't even need to have kids to feel the pain of that. But having kids must bring it right next to you in a way that makes it difficult to sleep last night. I could not believe the number of people I ran into yesterday who were legitimately trembling mad, like trembling, like it, as soon as it got to them, the idea of kids being slaughtered that way, uh, physically in the streets, I'm seeing again and again that news land on people. And it's like an alien movie where they start trembling and you're like, you know why they're angry that way because it's like, oh my God, look at what just landed on them. They just they just got the visual or the details of somebody had an assault rifle in a school. Yeah, everyone can relate. I would say that, and I don't want to do like, hey, I've been through this, so I've been through this, but unless you've been through it, unless your city has been through it, uh, you haven't really been through it. And I was through it years ago. 
uh, at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, and the rinse repeat nature of this is what drives me crazy. The outrage, the retweeting of Ted Cruz's gun policy, uh, tweeting at Ron DeSantis and Rick Scott, none of that works. Steve Kerr, what you did last night, I was inspired. It doesn't work. But there's nothing else to do, though. That's, that's the frustration. No, get your hands dirty. There well, are things you could do. It's it's not sitting at a podium, Dan, today, while I expect I'm, ta- I'm it. saying today. I'm saying today. There's not a lot that Steve Kerr can do in that moment. I understand. Other than use the platform that he has to, to be genuinely hurt and shaking mad. But I've seen the terror, and I've seen the fear, and I've seen it right in front of my face, and I feel for... Any city that has to go through this, and yesterday it was in Texas, and 10 days before that it was in Buffalo, um, because that stench never leaves your community. That feeling never leaves your community. It sits there forever. There are constant reminders of it uh, forever. And and the grief never leaves the parents who have lost their child. That is not something something that gets healed. That's something that stays, and people are altered in a way that leaves them changed. I can tell you what the... What the Florida parents did was they realized pretty early on there's an entire party who's reliant on the NRA's money, and they're not going to be able to change that. An entire party. And so what they did is try to affect change and instigate change where they could. And it was the red flag law, which is, I think, 90% of Americans agree with that particular law where if you post something on social media that is deemed a threat to a group of people, a school, whatever, red flags go up, authorities can go to the house, and they can take care of business from there. And it has prevented, Dan, uh, since this has been instituted in Florida, it has prevented other shootings. And so that's where I think we need to put our focus on, because the focus of trying to change it and get all these assault rifles all off the street Uh, That's not going to happen because I've seen people, lawyers in Parkland, try to make it happen. And they realize pretty early on, ain't going to happen. And so you got to focus on the things that you can actually change and things that can actually improve uh, what we're going through right now. Because this is just, it's it's heartbreaking. But before the solutions, right? Because this is what we do whenever we're helpless or hopeless. We try to go straight to wherever it is the solutions are. You sort of have to feel the thudding finality. Oh. Of all of it and the grief you have to uh steve kerr had a game last night and what whatever whether you think it's histrionics or a podium you can be mad at anybody here stugatz people are just mad today and there's a place oh no but you want to put the mad everywhere you want to put it in in all of the places i'm not mad at steve kerr i i appreciate what you're you're saying do more you're saying just i'm saying we all have i'm not saying i've done a lot i haven't done anything i'm guilty as charged i'm saying we all need to do more posting about it on twitter Ain't going to get it done. There there just isn't quite anything like this where the helplessness and the hopelessness and the lack of change makes it so that screaming somehow makes you feel slightly better about it because staying quiet and sitting in it doesn't feel any better. Going on social media and sharing with others how pissed off you are makes you feel something less helpless. Like Otherwise, you're just sitting there trembling mad by yourself. Right. Right? You're right. And pointing pointing out that... You know, certain politicians who are tweeting out how badly they feel when they can control some of this, you know, retweeting their policies, Dan, I get it. It makes you feel better. It doesn't solve the problem. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't solve the problem. I think it's instructive to hear from Stu Gatz just his experience in this, because for me, as someone who grew up in Connecticut, 40 minutes from Newtown, Sandy Hook, and watching my school system last night put out a, a, a statement saying we will be ready tomorrow. A statement of war. Right. We are going to arm our schools. Connecticut. Sandy Hook was 10 years ago. They're going to arm their schools to be ready for tomorrow. Yep. Something's got to change. And to your to your point, what are we what are we going to do? What are we going to be doing? Right now it feels like grief, but I like the the sentiment of we need action. We need to do something. And this seems like something that we should shoot for is actual red flag action. Yes. And when I I'm going to my daughter's preschool graduation on Friday. And all I can think about when I see her picture of walking with a gown on is the news yesterday. Of course. A processional to what? That's what I felt. 
I'm supposed to go to this graduation and be proud of my daughter, my firstborn kid going into elementary school and being excited for it. But now all I think about are those kids at Uvalde. That's all I think about. The other room, the shipping container there, I don't, I haven't talked to you guys about any of this. You look um, a bit hollowed out. Um, uh, Billy, uh, Chris, Roy, all uh, relatively new parents. Um, Claire started school five, uh, five months ago. And at that right now, that's all I'm thinking about right now is her safety. Like this is a relatively new school, so I don't really know the security process. I don't really know about that. And I am constantly worried, but what am I going to do? Like, I got to work. My wife has to work. Like, what am I going to do here? Like, your safety is my top priority here, and I am fearful right now, especially coming off of Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Like, I got twofold right now, and I'm sure Amin feels the same way about this. Like, we're under attack here. It feels uh, this, this this combination that you have in this country and the world post-pandemic, uh, this combination of two ingredients – Anger and fear, and now I throw in guns. Oof. Like just as a country, yeah. I throw, I, I, th- I put anger and fear together, and now I say, okay, and guns are readily available because all Kerr was calling for is like, hey, we all kind of agree that background checks, like weapons. There's an NRA convention in Dallas this week. It's a convention surrounding around tools meant to destroy human lives. Steve Kerr requesting that it be a little bit harder and that America and pointing out that Americans agree at a 90% clip that it should uh it should be a process in order to get a gun and common a tool, sense gun laws a, yeah. a tool in your hand that kills others as the as the conversation shifts very quickly to the politics of it and the second amendment and civil liberties and it always switches very quickly to you will not take my guns because so guys it's not much of a leap right to make the next once you get past the grief here and you see everything that is happening here, it is not much of a leap for someone to say, well, wait a minute, no, I'm not sure I'm good with the idea of something on social media, you could just come to my house and arrest me because something's been triggered on a red flag. No, I'm gonna be armed for that because I don't trust this country, I don't trust what freedom is, I don't trust America, I don't trust the police, I don't trust anybody now to just be able to come to my house because 90% of America says something on the internet is a red flag that makes them feel safer because someone's coming to my house house now the gun holders generally don't feel that way i've never owned a gun i don't know yeah. anything about guns i'm not someone who wants to be here having a debate today again again about gun safety immediately after this because this is how it always happens that's the rinse repeat you're talking about yes. everyone tries to go to the solution on how does this keep happening why do we let this keep happening and there have been no solutions at least in part because americans love their guns period hard stop I mean, Tom brought up Sandy Hook. There were 20 first grade children killed that day. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. Nothing. Yesterday, it was second, third, and fourth graders. I doubt anything's going to change. Somewhere, someone is planning the next one over the next 10 days. It needs to change, but it's not going to change by all of us getting outraged on social media. It's just, and listen, the red flag, Dan, it's it's a great point you made because there is a lot of debate about it, and it failed in Buffalo just 10 day, uh, days ago because there were warning signs everywhere, and it failed. So there's still work to be done there. I'm just saying we can't change an entire party relying on the NRA's money. So we need to focus on the things we can actually change. And these same people that are elected officials, um, like thoughts and prayers all going out yesterday. They're going to be at that gun conference on Friday. Like it's hypocrisy. As to God said, they're taking money from the NRA. Like it's complete bullshit. Like Ted Cruz, like there's a video of him shooting a, an assault rifle where he's wrapped bacon around the, around the barrel. Like he's cooking the bacon while shooting the gun. Texas is proudly, is very proudly 
a state where you are not to mess with anybody because a lot of people are armed. The governor has given voice to this in ways that doesn't like that California outbought them on guns recently. And thoughts and prayers in the face of that feel pretty empty. Every, anyone out there, the, the platitude of thoughts and prayers lands pretty hollow today. Yeah, I got to see this guy over here doing a press conference. While months earlier, he's made it easier for people to buy guns in Texas. Like, it, it's just infuriating to me. Um, bragged about it, too. So. Well, Stugatz, you mentioned nothing happened after Sandy Hook. That's not true. Gun rights lobbyist spending tripled after Sandy Hook. Right. They got more powerful. Yes. They, get, they, they saw that as a rallying cry. They mm-hmm. are going to take away our guns, and the guns rights lobbyist groups spent triple what they did the year before. Once Sandy Hook happened, I feel like these Ted Cruz, these lawmakers, these elected government officials are only going to become more entrenched in their beliefs that it's not about the guns. It's about the evil people. That's what they fall back on. Every they time. say, yeah. look at look at GTA out there. Look at all the video games that our kids are playing, shooting people's heads off. And we're OK with that. They point at that. And we're all over here saying, guns, get the guns out of here. Following Steve Kerr, say, get the guns out of this country. And they're saying the opposite. I think there's two Americas talking here. And if you go across the aisle in the Ted Cruz world, they're saying thoughts and prayers and feeling good about it because they feel safe in that space of we need to get people stop playing these video games and we need more guns, not less. They're tripled their spending after Sandy Hook. It's whataboutism as well. Like, all right, they're already talking about, oh, look at what's happening in Chicago. Uh, people, blacks gunning down other blacks. Like, they're already deflecting to another issue. And we got a guy down here in Florida over here talking about defending the Second Amendment, talking about, well, if the president is going to take all guns, he's going to learn quickly what's going to happen. Like, is that a threat? Are you threatening the president? Well, well, everything that's happening here is a threat. There's a threat. Like if the the combination of ingredients that I'm talking about makes everything a threat. If you talk about fear and guns and if you're combining anger, fear and guns, and we all know how divided everyone is, you throw those into a cauldron. You throw mental health problems into a cauldron. You throw everyone being divided into a cauldron already before we arrive here and On top of that, you throw the politics of all this. Like, I don't actually want to talk about the pieces of this that are one party controlled by the NRA or even the NRA, even though it is a powerful lobby. And we've been talking about some of this stuff. I mean, Bowling for Columbine was a long ass time ago by Michael Moore. We've been talking about this for a really long time. And the part we can agree on, though, everyone listening to this, everyone listening to this can agree on. Somebody on their 18th birthday with two assault rifles bought a gun and decided to go into school and just start mowing down toddlers like it's it like yep. young like and it, only because he's 18 then that's it just because he and, turned and, and 18 so instead of making you the cannot po- just turn 18 and be able to walk into but, a shop and buy assault rifles and he had body armor by the way well he, they, yes he was seen coming in and he was protected and there there is a th- There are a thousand places here where we can find something appalling. But in the place that we agree, though, Stugatz, I believe that everyone, no matter what you believe about the Second Amendment, because Tom mentioned something about video games, like these are all the arguments or getting guns out of the country. Like it doesn't even have to be that if you're someone who argues on behalf of, no, I want to have my gun. I don't trust the government. I, I Part of being an American is I get to have a gun. If you even want to make that argument. I believe we can all agree if the vision I'm presenting to you is the numbers went up overnight from what was thought to be 14 kids to 19 kids because the faces were so hard to identify and there were kids missing and there were parents in that interim with that school wondering, is my child one of them? But they had to identify the faces that were hard to identify of young people. That needs to be made harder to do. Yes. Like if you're someone who can do that, it needs to be something that in order to get the weapon, it has to be harder to get that weapon. I don't think that's an unreasonable thing, but all of this is talk and all of it is useless today. Like it is fundamentally useless today because 
Uh, the arguments don't stop. The, 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 the way that politics soak all this stuff and the arguments immediately go to the predictable places, even as Japan. Uh, but Japan has a video game problem, but doesn't have a gun or mass, mass shooting problem. I, I, I believe in logic. I just don't understand why it's so difficult to start at background checks to prevent the passage of guns. Like, like set aside already having a gun, like the passage of guns. Why can't we have a background check? Why can't we start there? I mean, I transitioned to you and basketball uncomfortably because uh, I don't think people are here. A lot of people are here to escape some of this stuff. I don't know that there's any escaping of it today. Uh, the the country, I mean, Roy, Roy mentioned it, and I know that uh, kids and kids being mowed down with guns feels like the worst of it, but it was 10 days ago that in, in a supermarket, elderly black people were mowed down uh, before that, uh, you know, church, Taiwanese people in a church. Um, you've got schools grocery stores, churches, that's an unsafe country. And I don't think people want their sports show to spend four hours here. So I will transition uncomfortably into whatever it is that's happening this evening, which is, uh, and, and Steve Kerr did this yesterday, where he's like, no basketball questions, came in, was pissed off, was hissing, uh, gave you his opinions and and then left the podium without uh, taking questions. The Miami Heat tonight play a basketball game with no Tyler Hero. I found that um, one of the things happening in this series that's funny is that Tyler Hero and Marcus Smart are important name players, and it seems like if both of them aren't playing, that's probably not a terrible thing for either team uh, based on the metrics. Like it's a it's a weird thing that the defensive player of the year and the uh, the, the guy who's sixth man of the year, uh, the numbers suggest that both of those guys aren't actually helping their teams when they're in there very much. Yeah, they're uh, they're they they are I don't want to say the victims, but they are they are the beneficiaries of great PR, right? They they do things on the basketball court that historically get attention. So we see Marcus Smart diving for loose balls and taking charges and flailing around and like, ooh, he's playing defense. You see Tyler Hero crossing people up and hitting crazy one-legged jumpers over guys. Ooh, he's playing offense. Uh, but the reality is that's a lot of flash, and the substance sometimes isn't quite what the flash is suggesting it is. I'm not saying that Marcus Smart is a bad defensive player. I'm not saying that Tyler Hero is a bad offensive player. But I am saying there is an overvaluation that happens when something visibly looks uh, appealing or is apparent in the same way that a decade plus ago, people used to say, oh, Kevin Garnett really is super competitive while Tim Duncan is stoic. Well, why? Is it because Tim Duncan doesn't scream and you know beat his chest and, and growl and crawl on all fours? Like That's what competitiveness is? Or is that just merely set dressing? The most important thing for the Heat tonight is the health of Jimmy Butler, is it not? Is there a more important thing in this game than the health of Jimmy yes, Butler? Yes, the, the, the health of Robert Williams III. Yeah, and Beta Bam, as we described him yesterday, is he going to have the same I, mentality as he did in Game 3, or is it going to be Game 4? I believe Billy said it's Gamma Bam. Yeah. Oh, oh, Billy oh, Billy, nothing. Oh, Billy Bama? had nothing to do with that. Oh, boy. You, you asked what was lower than Beta, and I said Gamma. I don't remember it don't that know, way. I, I think winning's the most important yeah, thing today, winning. to be honest with you. Yeah, of course One you mission, win the damn game. Yeah. Yep. Did you guys read uh, Dan's column yesterday? Yeah, Any but just for those who didn't, what did it say? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm wearing this shirt today because I was so moved by Dan's words. I know. I know. I, that's when what did I you thought. have time to write it? Yeah. That thing just popped up after the show. I was like, look at you. Yeah. Is it You're that easy for you? <laughs> did you just poop out a column? Uh, no, it is not that. What easy if Dan for me. just had like a ghostwriter that would write oh. these things for him, and before no one was aware, and now all of a sudden wow. we were all around Dan and we're like, Dan wasn't writing today, and boom, something comes out. Who is it? 
Billy, you should uh, you should read about James Patterson and what he does. Where uh, James Patterson, Is that the guy that made up the book, he's got hundreds of books because he just gets it. He's so popular that right? he just yeah he just farms it out and then comes and I guess he reads them and edits them. Dude, that's what uh, music some music producers like do, that. right? Yeah. Like Dr. Dre would have like all these guys that were schooled in how a Dr. Dre beat sound. So you guys remember Scott Storch? Yeah, he was one of those guys. So you remember that song "Still Dre"? Everyone said, "Oh, it's a Dre," because it sounds like a Dre beat, but it really was Scott Storch who did it, mm. because Dre has the stable of guys. Scott and Storch? yeah, remember him? What a the nostalgic! Guy from the guy from here? No, that's uh, Stapp. Oh, uh, Scorch was a Miami producer who was like a oh with the glasses, a perpetual clown yeah. show who like ran through all his money and was just like maximum Miami and Khaled before Khaled, flamboyantly reckless spender who was controlling music for a while down here and elsewhere. But you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned Riley culture and motivation. I'm curious, you as a front office person who admires the way of the Heat and knows how unusual it is. I mean, to have eight or nine guys who are 20 or 30 years in on aiding Riley, that that the Miami Heat basically have eight or nine spolsters around there. If you make, uh, you know, Ellisberg and some of those other guys, people who have been there forever, who came through the system, how rare is that given the turnover in basketball and how rare is this part of it? If you're not one of the lifers, if you're Stan Van Gundy, you get out of here, you're out of here forever. It's like you either stay or get out of here. Like you're not a part of what it is that we do around here not anymore. Not for everybody. How do you mean? Dwayne Wade's been able to come and go as he pleases. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's one of the few that's been allowed. That's correct. Zoe left also, right? Didn't Zoe leave that's in a right. huff? For the Nets. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about in the executive branch. Oh, I'm talking uh, about the people who form whatever is the, 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 the shirt you're wearing, the culture of the shirt you're wearing. Yeah, it's it, it, no, it is to me. I've, the greatest compliment I've paid them is that it, it's, I think it's an amazing system. I could never work there. Right, because the idea of how the rigidity—it's—it's it's what I would want if I were in charge of my organization. I would want it to be like that. I would want it to be, people are here and then they never leave, right? Because as you so eloquently put as a writer in your piece, the first part of the word culture is cult, and it is a cult, right? There is a a worshiping at the altar of Rileyism and and how uh, you know all the sayings. You listen to a Spo press conference. And it's all the same empty jargon. Or is that, I guess it's not empty. No, it can be empty jargon, but they believe it. It's their yep. Bible. It's like you could think it's empty jargon the way the same way an atheist sits in church and says that's empty jargon. Well, I think what's different about the Miami Heat organization is they almost invite conflict, whereas other organizations stray away, make sure we, hey, we can't have these two star players going at each other, whereas the Miami Heat like that because the scar tissue makes you stronger. In their minds, the scar tissue makes you stronger. And so Eric Spolster, when he gets into it with Jimmy Butler, they go on this incredible run. And now they're tied 2-2 in the East Finals. After that game, after that Jimmy Butler spat with Spo, I don't know if many people would say they are going to be th uh, two wins away from the NBA Finals today. But they are because this is what they're about. Pat Riley says that in the arguments with Alonzo Mourning, which I can't even imagine, I've always thought of Mourning as sort of the cartoon muscles manifestation of Riley's will, like the soldier who's always going out there fighting uh, for Riley. They would get in these back and forth like rabid with each other, and Riley's thing was, that's fine, Zoe, you could tell me fuck you, but please teach me something. Like, just, like, it's cool. Like, we'll go back and forth and we'll argue and, and the conflict will make us better, but here the heat are... Injured, coming off one of the most embarrassing things to ever happen to their team, and none of their players are on any of the all-NBA teams. So you can take your disrespects wherever it is that you find them, but as a classification, the people who give awards are telling you, well, all the other teams have the players who win this type of this time of year that that the Miami Heat don't have a, and don't have any of the signature players and Jimmy Butler's hurt, which is why I think Jimmy Butler's health is more important than Robert Williams is, because in, in the first game when Jimmy Butler and Robert Williams were ostensibly healthy, because Robert Williams at the beginning of that game was fine. Um, Jimmy Butler had whatever it was, 20 free throws or 18 free throws, 18 free throws. And he's had two in the last two games, two free throws. 
I mean, that's that's not Jimmy Butler anymore. If you take away Jimmy Butler's free throws, I don't even know what the player is, but it's not Jimmy Butler anymore. Like if I if I if I make Jimmy Butler all of a sudden a guy who gets a couple of free throws a game, he ceases on the spot to be Jimmy Butler. Yeah, I mean it's every great player has their area of plus points, right? Like Steph Curry's plus points are from the three point line. I take this shot, I get an extra point on it. Jimmy's just getting to the free throw line and converting there at a high clip, and so absolutely that's that's big. But I just feel like if Robert Williams isn't out there. The Miami Heat as a whole have an opportunity to get attack at the rim, right? And we talked about it for the last couple of days. Like, you want those three point shots to fall because it makes those lanes to the rim a lot easier and a lot simpler. And if the paint points are harder to come by, there's a lot more pressure for the threes to get made. And, and that kind of makes the whole thing collapse. If you ask me, it's not about Jimmy Butler. Again, it's, it's about Bam. It's about will Bam be aggressive and try to dominate you in the paint. You say be aggressive, but did Robert Williams keep him from being aggressive? Because he was aggressive in the game Williams didn't play in. So you tell me, because I'm not seeing that directly on each other. Like, I'm not seeing Bam trying to post up Robert Williams and then trying to do moves on Robert Williams and he can't get to the rim. I see a passive Bam who doesn't even take any shots, That's and I'm left point. to assume it's because Williams is just at the center of what is what has been statistically over the last half of the season the best defense in the league because of him, not because of Marcus Smart. Right. I mean, that, I think that's the point. The point, the great defense, we will talk about this all the time. What's great defense? It's not making you miss a shot. It's making you, making you say, ah, never mind. Here's, <laughs> here's a stat for that. I did some of my own research. If you haven't listened oh. to Basketball Illuminati, came out this morning. Yep. Open the third eye. Open the third eye. Here are Bam Adebayo's stats. Where is my third eye located? It's right between your other eyes. Yeah. Does it have to be? That's what I thought. If you don't know where it is, then you must not have it. Oh wow! Oh no! Yeah. So Bam Adebayo in this se- in this series against Robert Williams per thirty six minutes five field goal attempts per thirty six minutes. When Robert Williams the third is off the floor, that jumps up from five to thirteen. You talk about aggressive Bam Adebayo. Robert Williams is very much stifling aggressive Bam Adebayo. When he's on the floor, Bam is very much. A, a Joel Anthony. I dare say it. A Joel Whoa. Anthony who He's does not want to score. He's the warden. But when Robert Williams is off the floor, he turns into the 20 point scorer. He turns into Joel Embiid. See that? Wow. Two Joels. One Whoa. Bam. Carmelo wow. Anthony, you could have done too. You could have done from Joel yeah, Anthony. Anthony Carmelo. Carmelo Anthony. Oh, that's a good one too. I think that might be better. Yeah. No, but like, here's the thing, oh, Dan. The, uh, <laughs> the. 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 The irony is, you know how to get Robert Williams out of there without, like, obviously hoping he's hurt. And foul trouble. Foul trouble. You go through him. You have, in essence, the solution is to not be reticent, is to go right at him and force him to try to guard you again and again and hope he gets foul in foul trouble. And now you get him off the floor. He also black. He also blocked. Excuse me. Whoa. Freudian slip. <laughs> He also oh, okay. <laughs> he also blocked uh, Bam's shot, right? He blocked a bunch of shots. He the floater, the the wonderful flip shot of PJ Tucker that looks like grandpa basketball. It's just ridiculous. It belongs nowhere in the NBA, but it always goes in, and it makes me happy when it does. It's like seeing a granny shot go in, or like an Ephus pitch when PJ Tucker moves through the lane and flip shots it up there. Even that got blocked, but I. I seem to remember in the last game, I don't think I have this wrong, that Bam also got his shot blocked, which I'm not terribly used to seeing. Uh, and if I'm misremembering that, at the very least, I ask you guys this question. Uh, Bam Adebayo is an all-star. Is there such a thing as an all-star who just gets erased by another defensive dude, whether it's a defensive player of the year or not? Like where not... You're saying be more aggressive, get foul shots, but you're also saying Robert Williams makes you not even want to take the shot. And what's happening with Bam is a dissolving and a disappearance that uh, is not merely unbecoming for an all-star. I don't know how often you see it, that an all-star simply can't get shots against, never mind points against, shots against somebody on the court. Like, you're telling me that Robert Williams is that much better at defense than Bam Adebayo is at offense? Well, it's not just Robert Williams, I should say. Al Horford, too, when he's shading off and seeing that Bam Adebayo wants to get work. Like, that it, that feels like, to me, not just about Robert Williams. That Those two guys, Al Horford and Robert Williams, are excellent defenders and perfectly 
suited to guard against the Miami Heat, where they know exactly, because they've been in these battles before, they know exactly what they want to get. And Bam Adebayo, although he's a good scorer in this league, he is not a guy who's Joel Embiid out there. So yes, I do think he can get neutralized by the defense, in my book, the best defender on the Boston Celtics. It's not neutralized I'm talking about, though, Tom. I'm talking about getting no shots. That's different than neutralized. I, I, I would say the other part of that is all interconnected, Tom, because if P.J. Tucker... Is three or five from three, mm-hmm. as opposed to oh four or oh five, whatever. Or Struce or Struce or any of those guys. It makes it harder for Horford to do that. One hundred percent to to shade over. They can't they can't cheat as much as a defense if the if the shots are falling. When did Robert Williams become Ben Wallace? Like this happened a couple weeks ago. Have I just? I mean, I watched the some Celtics. I have not not watched they, the Celtics. They get, all season. I saw that Brad Stevens got a ton of credit this last off season for getting him at value. Like this was the first move of switching out from Ainge and getting out from under the whole idea of we never trade our draft picks for every, any, anybody, even though everyone thinks we're going to trade all our draft picks. Uh, one of the first things Brad Stevens did upon getting into that front office was get celebrated for getting Robert Williams at value as a defensive player. No, wait, Robert Williams has been there. He's been there for four no, years. I know, but get I'm saying extending him for whatever oh, it was. Gotcha. Like he extended him for like forty or fifty yep. million dollars and it was yeah. cheap. Yeah, I mean like, look, they they the, the day they drafted him, they they knew he was a guy with a checkered past, but that's why he fell to the pick that he was, right? If Robert Williams didn't have some of the issues he had, and it was mostly like just smoking weed, right? Like he would have gone much higher in the draft. Much higher. Like, everyone saw the talent. And, you know, it's not like these NBA teams are making moral judgments about, oh, I don't want someone who messes with the wacky tobacco. It's more about, bro, are you going to be eligible? Or are you going to be, like, on the list all the time? Well, Dan, guess what happened two seasons ago? Coinciding with the rise of Robert Williams. No more drug testing for marijuana. So... Like, you know, like, oh, oh, all of a sudden now, like, uh, Chris is asking, when did this guy become Ben Wallace? As soon as they stopped testing for marijuana. Now he can smoke as much as he wants and you go out there and produce. And by the way, that's how it should be because clearly it doesn't have an impact on his play. Who is the guy that you look at physically or in demeanor in a position of authority that you have making in that voice the condemnation? He messes with the wacky tobacco as like, uh, (laughs) a horrified sort of concern on behalf of the blueprint in the league that somebody messes with the wacky uh, tobacco. I will start with Terry Stotts. Does, uh, it, ha- does it have to be in the league? Because I was thinking Lou Holtz. Uh, I was thinking uh, Hubie Brown. Bob Cousy. Okay, you guys are all going no, to no. incredibly old Hubie, people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hubie, I got Hubie Brown rolling one up like wow. in his office. And Guillermo, like, put it on the poll. Okay. Do you have uh, Hubie Brown rolling up some wacky tobacco? Yes or no? I know the Heat fans get a bad rap for this persecution complex, but when you have nobody that makes All NBA and your coach doesn't win Coach of the Year, all right, if you're a one seed and you have no All NBA players, that's got to be some good coaching. That's exactly no respect. Anyway, that's exactly right. If anything, I think the Heat reach out to the voters and say, "Do not vote Mm. for a single member of this organization. We're not about these bullshit awards." (laughs) We're here to motivate the players, so we are going to not give them anything until they that's get to the I NBA said. Finals. You like exactly agree, you what agreed Chris with said. Me, yeah, but no, that's Chris not what is I right. Said. That's yeah. what he's right. You know, these athletes yeah. always need that chip on their shoulder. Exactly. I think organizations do too. They want mm-hmm. that persecution. Yeah, me, they Chris want Tom, to be canceled on the on the awards. Absolutely, I believe, I believe that. Yeah, I could call Chris. This is a line from Dan's article: <laughs> "Mortality approaches, immortality awaits." Oh my wow. God! Wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. G-bums. Words. Unless they lose the next two. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, no, no. <laughs>